And hey everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Introduction to the United Nations. You know, we're uh, getting down to the end here, and uh, this is really the penultimate section of our class as we examine one of the last of the main pillars of the UN's roles and obligations in the world. And, you know, I, this one is probably the most open-ended, uh, the most uh, confusing, the most ambiguous. Um, but in the last 20 years, it's also growing into one of the most important elements of the UN. Um, the whole idea of the UN and its um, quote-unquote development agenda is... If, if, if nothing else, the United Nations attempt at trying to really be a force for global governance, um, at least in terms of the humanitarian, the social democratic, the qualitative aspects. And, you know, b before we even begin here, the UN's developmental agenda is really, it, it should be understood in two broad categories. The first is the understanding that the United Nations um, has to take on an increasingly more proactive role in global development, at least in terms of the human factor. Um, but the second one, and one that's not really mentioned within the literature, but something that you can kind of put two and two together to figure out, is that the developmental agenda is really a response to, I'd even go so far as to say a reaction, to a far more sustainable um, and unrelenting 20 to 30 years of international global economic development that has, in many cases, led to the necessity for development, right? So you kind of look at the, the visual here, and this is representative of the UN's Sustainable Developmental Goals, of which there are 17. Um, and many of them are very, very broad, um, certainly um, well-intentioned, but you got to think, you know, how does one achieve some of these goals? Um, you know, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, uh, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequality, sustainable cities and developments, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And finally, out of all of this, partnerships for achieving the previous 16 goals. Um, I mean, th this looks like an almost Herculean task. One that even if the United Nations was actually a global world government uh, would find very difficult to achieve, um, many of these issues have you know, certainly existed before the last 30 years of globalization, but their problems have only been exacerbated um, due to a number of technocratic solutions uh, to the developing world that have created um, you know, many, many problems in terms of resource allocation, environmental degradation, uh, global economic inequity, um, and an increase um, in human rights violations, all really in the pursuit of sort of targeted economic development and the elevation of one small percentage of the population, I have to say, unfortunately, at the direct expense of the other. So if you're trying to wrap your head around what is it that we're going to talk about this week and what exactly constitutes the UN's development agenda, you can kind of think of it as a little bit of everything and anything. And unfortunately, by trying to address everything all at once, it's not a surprise that the UN does little more than just raise the rhetorical need to address these issues. Um, but why are uh, many of these problems somehow hamstrung, uh, whether under institutional mismanagement or just simply, you know, global politics? So, the, you know, the problems that we need to address um, right from the start with the UN and this broad sense of development, right? And I, and I put the term in quotes because development really here is um, just a very, very, very broad understanding of, you know, making the world better for, you know, as many people as possible, is that it first begins with institutional, more like read as rhetorical commitments to what are ultimately qualitative concerns and problems. So in other words, you know, it's, it's one thing to raise awareness about what needs to be done. And, you know, in our previous discussions on um, human rights and humanitarian intervention, 
Um, you know, everything usually begins with some kind of normative, subjective, moral imperative to, quote, do something, unquote, right? We have to do something in the world. We can't just sit idly by. Um, when it involves things like resource allocation, uh, the reduction of poverty, the um, improvement in education, um, the insurance that, um, you know, as many people as possible have access to uh, clean drinking water. Um, it's easy to say this needs to be done. Right? And if one, you know, bases oneself uh, rhetorically within these moral principles, um, they absolutely have to be accomplished. But this requires active involvement and engagement with community leaders and cooperation from state officials. Things that, again, might seem obvious, but here's where the wheels fall off the proverbial wagon as far as the UN is involved. Um, and what's even more problematic is that these large-scale visions of aid, which I don't want to say didn't exist prior to the UN mentioning them. I mean, they've been sort of conceptualized now for, for, for decades, if at least not you know a century, is that these normative ideas of human development are either countered or sidelined by existing economic-oriented structural adjustment programs. So in other words, one of the other big things that this um, lecture hopes to impart is that technocratic solutions to human development oftentimes create new problems in human development. Because if the bottom line is ultimately economic solvency, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that is going to have a high risk of damage on either the environment, natural resources, or some kind of collective social democratic equity. So when the issue of trying to address human development within and oftentimes against technocratic policies comes up, most of the time, the technocratic policies win out, not because the world is somehow um, tuned off to social democratic values, but because the technocratic policies are oftentimes connected with institutions and organizations that are far better coordinated and have years, if not decades, of on-the-ground activity before the UN decides to step in. So a third thing to take away from this discussion is that considerations of developmental aid is oftentimes coming after aid is needed years later, right? We're talking about almost a reaction to um, the growing inequalities of global economics, especially when free market fundamentalism exacerbates these differences socially, politically, um, and even economically. And the third thing to note, um, which kind of already adds, you know, an undue amount of pessimism uh, to what is hopefully seen as a way forward, is that the United Nations is, as we've already, you know, identified, um, horribly mismanaged, um, just bureaucratically decentralized, um, met, and, and it is met with a whole bunch of, you know, administrative obstacles, dysfunctionalities, um, and, uh, you know, misaligned organizations that, you know, ultimately prevent ideas, lofty but very noble ideas, from becoming actual policy. And, um, you know, this lecture, among other things, should serve as a sobering reminder that for those who in sort of envision working at the United Nations, especially within that, you know, second tier, uh, where you're working with this, you know, with this uh, secretariat or ECOSOC, you know, you're a true international worker, and you want to make the world a better place, or at least a little area that you're assigned to, you need to understand one big thing. When you work for the United Nations, be prepared to be disappointed, because it is like any other bureaucratic organization riddled with dysfunctionality, um, redundant offices, um, limited budgets, and, uh, you know, competing personalities. So, you know, there is a big difference between the rhetorical lofty statements about what needs to be done versus what actually happens um, as an output. And so, you know, it's not a surprise that the UN, um, as something that still has a high degree of public legitimacy and credibility, um, 
you know, is criticized for its lack of authority, coordination, and actual implementation. Um, so, you know, this kind of necessitates um, just a very brief recap of what we know so far uh, before we tackle this final element of our study of the United Nations. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, uh, lecture series, the UN rests broadly on four pillars, right? You can kind of think of these are the four pillars that, you know, prop up the organization and give it some reason to function. Collective security and peacekeeping is probably one of the oldest and most well-defined. Um, this is uh, one of the um, elements that, you know, went into the, um, you know, the, the theoretical and ideological foundation of the UN in the 1940s. Uh, we have looked over the past few weeks at uh, the second and third pillar, uh, humanitarian relief and human rights and international law. And we've come away with um, understanding both as sort of a mixture between uh, normative imperatives and uh, empirical capabilities, right? Especially when it comes to international law, um, you know, it's one thing to say that things are on the books. Um, it's another thing to actually have that law uh, be implemented, um, you know, towards a target country or a region. Sometimes it works, and other times the countries are powerful enough, rich enough, diplomatically salient enough to, you know, wiggle their way out of uh, meeting commitments or um, abiding by certain rules. Um, and if we walked away thinking that um, both of these were a bit more normative than empirical, well, wait until you get to development, right? This is the final pillar. We haven't looked at it in any detail just yet, but as you've already seen, I'm putting this in quotes because development, as I've known, as I've already mentioned, with 17 broad-based goals, kind of is this mishmash, hodgepodge collection of everything that just needs to be addressed um, you know, implemented, solved, improved um, in the world today, right? Everything from human rights to environmental protection to, um, you know, reducing um, problems in human inequality that have existed pretty much as long as humans have lived in collective groups. So, you know, is the UN something that is, um, you know, capable of solving these problems? No. I mean, that's, you know, as long as, you know, humans continue to exist and, you know, free market capitalism runs the show, I mean, there will be, you know, degrees of poverty, inequality, inequity. There will be uh, human rights violations. I mean, these are just, you know, the, the unfortunate realities of life. But does that mean that the United Nations should just kind of give up? Right. And, you know, as the classical realists of old uh, just kind of conclude that, well, you know, the world is full of idiots and always will be. The world sucks. The only thing that we can do is just make our own little areas, um, you know, as best as we can. And, um, you know, that would be one thing if the U.N. operated on principles of realist ideology. Um, but last I checked, you know, liberalist philosophies, which uh, hold true to the understanding that, you know, the world can be a better place. Humans are by nature good. And it is up to institutions like the UN and smaller subsidiaries, like maybe, you know, the European Union, to, if not make the world a better place, at least, you know, some areas slightly less crappy than it was uh, five years ago, well then, you know, so be it. And this is kind of the silver lining that will drive this uh, discussion, right? Far from being perfect um, and well known to being prone to dysfunctions and mismanagement, um, you know, the UN has been rather resilient, you know, despite all of its, you know, warts, lumps, and bumps. Uh, the UN was designed to evolve with uh, changing international challenges and commitments. Um, it might be slow, might be cumbersome, it might usually be a couple of years late, um, but it is an organic learning organization. Um, we could even go so far as to say that, uh, you know, the, the, the decentralization that exists within ECOSOC and even the Secretariat kind of gives the UN some kind of like informal flexibility to address an issue or problem without having to call in all of the, you know, top administrative officials to agree on something, right? In other words, you know, you just kind of create an organization, get an outside donor to fund you, um, you know, get a staff. Um, and, you know, sometimes two thirds of ECOSOC don't even know that you exist, but, you know, that doesn't really matter. You're on the ground, you're helping people out in some 
small way, but that's still helping some people out, um, you know, that adds to, you know, public legitimacy and credibility, right? Which is something that the UN still has. This is one of those ace in the hole things that uh, we can't really, um, and we shouldn't, um, you know, underestimate. And that is that despite all of the UN's problems, and they are many, um, as the world becomes more and more interdependent, and as, you know, challenges to human development, existence, sustainability um, are more and more transnational, right? I mean, you got to think about that. Like, what's the biggest, let's say, threats to the world today? Um, many people would say climate change, right? Global warming, climate change, the environment, right? You don't have that. I mean, everything else is you know, inconsequential. There's no one state that can solve these problems, right? We've already discussed this, and I think this is, you know, at this point, pretty clear. Um, and because there's no other organization out there that takes this stuff as seriously as the UN does, the UN is kind of by default the organization that has to have some kind of moral leadership, right? And if the UN does nothing more in terms of development than raise awareness and provide guidance, it's a small step, right? And this is the unfortunate reality with UN development, right? Two steps forward with the clear understanding that you may have to take one to one and a half steps back. Um, but if you've progressed just slightly from where you set out, um, and that's enough. I mean, it's, it's sort of a guarded optimism, but it's enough to, you know, keep the you know, momentum going with the hope, right, that newer generations are going to uh, take things like human development and sustainable, um, you know, um, economics far more seriously than some of the free market fundamentalists. So, you know, it, it's worth also remembering that this is not something that has been just grafted onto the UM um, without its prior preparation. Uh, recall also, and this was in the beginning of our lecture, that the foundations of the UN kind of had this little area of development, you know, built in, right? It was, it was brought up um, at the San Francisco Conference in 1945 to, if not immediately, address the issues of human development and well-being, um, but design the organization to, at some point in the future, the organization would have the capacity and the space uh, to do so. Um, and again, we can thank um, a good number of delegates from the developing world, specifically Latin America and the Middle East, for adding this element to the existing understanding of what collective security meant at the time, right? And if collective security also means safeguarding human development and well-being, well then, so much the better. But to that, we also need to remember that for the first 45 years of its existence, right, the UN was kind of hamstrung in what it could do and how far-reaching its international authority, legitimacy, and credibility was. Um, it's just one of those things that we just kind of need to take on faith that, you know, 1990 was this um, very critically important year, right? 1990 marked um, a watershed moment for the United Nations um, in terms of, I think, two to three big, big, big trans, you know, transitioning periods. Number one, um, 1990 marked the beginning of the end of the bipolar power arrangement, right? The Soviet Union dissolved at the end of 1991, uh, but the Cold War sort of came to a definitive end. Um, and within this period, right, I'd like to say that 1990 wasn't just this one year, but it was kind of the beginning of a five-year transitioning period, really from 1990 to 1995. By 95, we not only see the end of the bipolar uh, power arrangement, but we see the advent of globalization, um, and with that, really two things. Um, the apparent triumph of free market capitalism, and the accompanying triumph, or at least we like to think so, of liberal democracy as a global ideology, right? So liberalism as an IR theory wins out. Um, 
with the you know fall of the Soviet Union, the la- you know the end of let's say the last major political ideological ism um, in competition for what would be you know sort of a global model for governance and organization, communism effectively becomes um, you know a relic of the past, and you know all roads, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, um, lead eventually to liberal democracy. So what this does is it puts the principles of human rights, life, liberty, property, freedom, um, you know, um, um, optimism for a better future, really at the forefront of international ideology. And so because the United States, even in the 90s, right, powerful, far more powerful than it was right now, um, doesn't have the capability, or better yet, the interest in spreading this gospel to all corners of the world, um, the UN kind of exists by default, right? It takes on these increasing responsibilities to address um, a number of transnational problems, challenges, and goals um, in order to make these beliefs, these philosophies, uh, come to fruition. And even if it doesn't happen in you know a few years, and as we can comfortably say, it hasn't happened in a few decades. Um, you know, we are making that steady progress. Um, and you know, so when you think about it, really in, in in broad terms, the UN has only really become a global organization in the past thirty years. Right? It's existed for seventy five. Um, but I like to say that the first 45, the UN was just kind of like there as a secondary institution. It really is within the last 30 or so years that the UN has stepped up its game, um, especially in, you know, being at the forefront. In, if not tackling, then at least addressing problems in conflict resolution, humanitarian intervention, human rights, developmental aid, environment and climate change, and public health. Um the pessimist would look at all of this and say, well, the last 30 years have been a mixed bag in which the UN kind of works when it wants to and ignores when it chooses to. Uh, the, guarded pes- the guarded optimist, on the other hand, sorry, would have you believe that it's not surprising that the UN has been kind of sporadic and haphazard in its successes because it's a growing evolving organization that, well, we have to remember, was never designed to be a world governing body, right? This is the this is the big crux is that the UN has taken on this responsibility to tackle many problems in the world today. But because it is not a world governing body, nor was it ever intended to replace the authority of the state, this responsibility that the UN has means that it can only be as influential and as authoritative in its beliefs, policies, rhetoric, as what its member states allow it to be, right? And this is kind of the, um, you know, one of the first rules of understanding international institutions is that unless its members willingly delegate, for lack of a better word, federal powers to said organization, that organization is still going to defer and rely on the decision-making of its member states. So in that sense, the UN is already hamstrung in what it can really do versus what it can bring up. But if we accept that, right, as the world that we have to live in, it doesn't mean that the UN is useless, right? Again, I need to emphasize that the structure of international institutionalism, like the UN finds itself in, can still give it a number of advantages, and in some cases, um, exonerate it from any wrongdoing because the people at fault are state leaders, not UN officials. So the structure of international institution can provide what I'd like to call a space for the UN to operate, right? It can, res- it can assume responsibilities um, for you know, kind of creating creating a sense of collective thought, uh, collective opinion towards upholding certain principles of liberalism, right? Certain principles of human development, equality, and equity. 
And even though it doesn't have the authority to do anything about it, it can provide guidance. It can provide a sense of moral guidance and philosophies that no one state can claim. And if we you know, frame our mind within this institutional setting, right, we understand that global norms today are largely designed and upheld by the United Nations. And it is up for, you know, countries as powerful as China, Russia, and the U.S., or as weak as um, Central African Republic, Haiti, and Bangladesh uh, to implement or ignore, right? So, you know, the thing about institutionalism is that even though the U.N. will not replace the state, Um, and its expanding roles in addressing uh, these issues are often gradual, cumbersome, and sometimes even competitive uh, between internal departments and organizations, right? I mean, look, I'm going to be honest. You know, the UN, when it comes to developmental aid, is a hot mess, right? It's just a a complete institutional um, Gordian knot. But in the grand scheme of things, right, the UN... Um, brings to the collective four a set of principles, goals, and aspirations that, you know, on this broad level, you can't really oppose. Um, and you want to try your best to, if not meet full obligations, try to do something. All right, try to do something to get further towards those goals. So, you know, with all of that said, then what do we effectively mean? by developmental assistance, right? It's, it's a very, very broad um, scope of ideas, as I've said, ranging, you know, all sorts of different policies, regions, areas, concerns. Um, the first thing to understand is that even though the United Nations only started taking this stuff seriously after 1990, um, as I mentioned, it was loosely envisioned and kind of codified within the UN Charter in 1945, right? I specifically um, refer you to chapters 9 and 10 of the charter. Now, the wording is very open-ended and highly interpretive, but it's enough, right, to get us to note that, all right, this is something that the UN can and should do. Chapter 9 um, identifies the United Nations as an organization that needs to address, quote-unquote, international economic and social cooperation right? Uphold, promote, and facilitate. It is within chapter 10 that we get the most specific. And again, don't get, don't read too much into specifics here, but specific here calls for the establishment of ECOSOC, like one of the big sub-level divisions within the United Nations, right? On par with the secretary, the general assembly, uh, the security council, uh, and the trusteeship council. Um, The only problem with ECOSOC is that It is increasingly the largest, the most bureaucratic, and the most day-to-day active of all of the main institutional subunits. But there's no real organization. There's no real coordination, right? ECOSOC, when you think about it, ECOSOC stands for the Economic and Social Council. So it's almost like these are two afterthoughts to miscellaneous things that, you know, when the UN was being designed in the 1940s, we're talking about collective security within the Security Council, and we're talking about some kind of like visual figurehead um, with the uh, Secretariat, the, um, the UN Secretary General. Um, even to the point of having more defined features in the Trusteeship Council, simply because it's a, um, um, a leftover relic of the League of Nations, ECOSOC is just kind of like everything else that we'll eventually get to. I, I like to think of it as um, a, a computer motherboard that um, taking into account something that we may have to deal with in the future are going to have a bunch of slots for memory cards, video cards, and other things that haven't even been developed yet. But when they do come, right, the, um, you know, the the motherboard is there that will allow the space, right, for these things to develop, okay? So, you know, the thing is, is that the, um, you know, the developmental agenda, the, the whole notion of developmental assistance started out as something almost conceptual, like metaphysical, now, within the last 20, 30 years, comprises the largest element 
of this second UN, right? The Secretariat and all of the international organizations that go along with that. So for those that, you know, envision, dream about getting a job in the UN, that doesn't represent one specific country, but you want to be on one of the UN committees, you want to be on one of the UN departments that look at, um, you know, clean air, the environment, agriculture, women's rights, human rights, or all the, these are the things that, you know, kind of give you the sense of I'm a global worker. I'm going to, you know, really make an impact on the international stage. Um, you will find something within this broad umbrella network of developmental assistance um, that, in, that in some cases is either connected to ECOSOC, um, answers to the secretariat, um, sometimes both, sometimes neither, sometimes you have no idea what, right? It's just kind of this loosely defined, incoherent gaggle of organizations, um, which helps explain why development, right? The concept of development in, in, in quotes here has taken on a multitude of parallel overlapping competitive and autonomous goals, right? So for something as critically important as developmental agendas are today for a number of transnational problems. Uh, you know, the UN is just kind of hamstrung from the beginning in just having zero organization whatsoever. You know, it's like, a, you, know, a, you know, a hard drive that's got folders, you know, here, there, everywhere. You have no idea where anything is. Um, the closest that we've come is uh, in 2015 with the passing of these 17 uh, sustainable developmental goals, which um, you can kind of already figure out how little effort was put into this, right? The sustainable goals were, you know, initiated in 2015 to be largely met by 2020. And, well, we've passed that mark, and the goalposts have now been pushed to 2030. And I'm going to put money on this, okay? If anybody's listening, you want to, you know, find me in another nine years, um, if we still haven't solved global hunger and economic inequality by 2030, I guarantee you we're going to push that goalpost down to 2035 or maybe even 2040. It doesn't mean that it's not being addressed, but I think that these tasks, um, if they're not Herculean, they're undeniably, you know, Sisyphean. And we have to put this also into um, one other large framework. And that is developmental goals, developmental agendas are taking place in an age of globalization, which, you know, shouldn't sound all that, um, you know, strange. And in many situations gives us an understanding of uh, why the UN has become more active. Um, but when we look more specifically at what defines the age of globalization, and we understand that the first element to really realize um, that globalization was a thing was the economic um, elements. And oftentimes the economic elements operate in direct um, contest to state protectionism, state democratic, and state welfare institutions. We begin to realize that these sustainable goals are oftentimes remedies to a sector of globalization that operated largely unabated and uncontested for about 10 to 15 years. So, you know, the current age of globalization that we find ourselves in is really an age of international, transnational market capital, which explains the breaking down of, you know, previously existing barriers, um, not for, you know, creating a borderless society, but largely to facilitate the free flow of capital uh, without being encumbered with tariffs, protectionist measures, currency exchanges, um, anything that might halt the flow of goods and services, right? Within the understanding of capitalism, any state that chooses to maintain these protectionist measures runs the risk of um, you know, forcing this capital to look for more fertile and lucrative grounds elsewhere, right? So the understanding is that if globalization facilitates unfettered flow of capital to wherever it is in the world, 
The developing world, right, the comparatively poorer areas, right, here we're talking about, again, Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, um, you know, anything that is in need of modernization and industrialization. Um, you know, in the olden days, if we were to think about this, um, states would have the capabilities, the, um, um, the wherewithal to kind of develop sort of a homegrown economy on their own. In the age of global capital, you don't have to worry about that. You just kind of open up your state borders. You open up your state protectionist measures, and you let outside companies kind of come in, set up shop in you know, Nigeria, in Kenya, in China, Indonesia, Cambodia, elsewhere, whatever it is, right? And you just kind of let the capital come from the outside. And this is going to provide a lot of quick fix solutions, right? Especially, you know, if we were to, um, you know, add the, um, you know, the dawn of the internet as a part of the age of globalization. Most, you know, economics these days um, is digital and is really being conducted, you know, um, within a digital world. These are, for the most part, the realm of technocratic approaches to development, growth, and modernization. And, you know, what we have realized, um, certainly within the last 10 years or so, especially following the 2008 Great Economic Recession, is that technocratic solutions to, you know, development, growth, and modernization oftentimes comes at the direct expense of democracy, especially social democracy. Um, and when we add to that the understanding that many of these developing countries are for lack of a better word, forced to take a number of loans in order to modernize their economy faster than what would normally be, or to somehow subsidize many outside corporations in, you know, sort of literally, you know, giving them the opportunity to choose this country over another, we find that these countries become more impoverished and more financially dependent on the market than benefiting it. And of course, if you were to, you know, follow the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the financial paper trail here, right? The, you know, the more developed countries, they have the money, they have the capital, they're the ones that are lending the resources, right? So they benefit off of these developing countries. And so you can kind of imagine that, you know, when countries are forced to reduce as many institutional barriers and obstacles as possible to allow, you know, an automobile, like, you know, a BMW factory or, um, you know, an Apple, um, you know, workshop or a Tesla factory, you know, it's coming up with names right here, right? You can kind of figure out, right? Local employment suffers. Wages are not commensurate with output. Unions are completely and utterly looked down upon. Um, environmental regulations that would be seen as costly to global capital just become unraveled. And it's, you know, it's not a surprise that you find uh, within the last, you know, 25 to 30 years, right? Rivers become polluted, air becomes toxic, forests become cut down for, you know, wood and other open uh, areas. Um, natural resources become uh, completely exploited, which not only has a disastrous effect on the ecosystem, but also on plant and animal wildlife. You know, the fact that uh, in the last 25 to 30 years or so, a number of animals are, you know, endangered, if not critically endangered, just because of demands in the global market, you know, leads us to understand that, you know, neoliberal economic solutions, which, you know, oftentimes put all hope in the market, are oftentimes the most detrimental, the most problematic to a sustainable future. And on top of that, it's not a surprise that many countries in the developing world um, experience weakening democracies and an unraveling, a deregulation of social welfare. And you don't even have to look, let's say, in Africa or uh, Central and Eastern Europe. We can even look here in the United States, right? I teach, um, a I know another class many of you know this semester, um, on ethnic politics. And right now, you know, we are looking at uh, the effect of gutting of the economic sectors in many former working class hubs of the United States, right? So free market fundamentalism is going to, you know, give companies like GM and Ford and Chevrolet, just, you know, for instance, Boeing is another good example of that, the ability to pack up and move wherever it wants. But what does that do to the workers that are left behind? What does that do to small businesses 
What does that do to, you know, a general interconnected network of social, political, and economic livelihoods that, you know, involve and depend on each of these for some kind of interlocking development and growth? One thing is removed and a chain reaction effectively impoverishes, right, the entire uh, neighborhood, the entire voting constituency. So, you know, you, you look at the global market today and, yeah, you know, Business Insider and Wall Street uh, Journal and, uh, you know, even New York Times and, you know, uh, Washington Post, Financial Times would have you believe, you know, the economy is never doing better. You know, the Dow is increasingly rising. People are getting making money hand over fist. But at what cost? Right. At what cost? See, this is kind of the problem that we find is that in the age of globalization, we end up noting that what is done to make a small segment of the population incredibly rich and prosperous oftentimes, you know, happens through, you know, absolute gains um, between rich and poor. So by putting the emphasis on the private sector as a vehicle for economic growth and by, you know, emphasizing the alleged importance on low, you know, low rate inflation and price stability, um, calling for the shrinking of state bureaucracies, the elimination of lowering tariffs, the opening of your country up to investment, and the subsequent deregulating of your economy, um, you know, shock therapy, uh, you know, models of economic development basically say to the developing world, lay down your defenses. And just open yourself up, just spread them wide open and let the market do whatever it's going to do to you. Um, and with the understanding that, yeah, there might be um, a small period of transition that might be difficult for some people, especially countries that are just emerging onto right the uh, the global market. Right, you're coming in from previously protected tariffs, protectionist economies. Um, yeah, that period of adjustment is going to be bad. You know, in five years, maybe ten years at the absolute most. Um, but the shock therapy of the Washington consensus, right? This is one of the big um, proponents of basically unfettered free market capital investment will have you believe that, you know what, suck it up and suffer for about five years, 10 years at the most, they argue. Um, but within that time, right, and if you play your cards right, and you do what's and you do what's necessary, and you just kind of weather the initial storm of transition, which means that yeah, there's going to be people that will be put out of work, there's going to be smaller industries and businesses from smaller companies that might just be overtaken, you know, just they just can't compete in the global market. Uh, but eventually, eventually, right, everything will stabilize again. Thank you, free, uh, thank you, invisible hand theory. And, um, you know, prosperity will eventually um, help everyone else out, right? So you just kind of deal with it for five years, 10 years. And then after that time, we'll all be laughing about how much we had to deal with it, but we're all going to be better off. This, of course, has proven to be enormously wrong. Right? What has happened is that these you know, macro structural conditions, right? what I like to call the cookie cutter solutions that are you know, created uh, by the IMF, the Washington consensus, um, you know, and other uh, technocratically oriented institutions before the UM right, gets its act together, um, these organizations aren't necessarily anti-democratic they're just simply non-democratic. The thing that we've come to recognize is that um, economic development doesn't directly care about democracy. It doesn't care about social welfare. And in many situations, if economic solvency needs to be preserved over democratic accountability, that's just what's going to happen. Um, and we've seen this in Greece. We've seen this repeatedly in the United States. We have seen this in Iceland, in you know the United Kingdom, in Italy, in Spain, no, no, in, in Thailand, you know, no matter what, right? If push comes to shove, economic solvency will be saved um, in favor of democratic accountability. Uh, with the understanding that these are going to be temporary setbacks in which uh, 
maintaining commercial pacifism will rectify any you know economic recession or downturn in a country you know in a year or two right as long as these countries remain on the global market yeah you're going to get strikes and gutters you're going to get booms and busts you know but at the end of the day you know the market keeps increasing right you keep your money in the stock market without panicking during major recessions and your money's going to go up right and this is actually a good parallel to to make right now right if let's say a year ago, right? A year ago, COVID was just about, you know, was really proving to be long. This is gonna be a lot longer than two, three weeks. And the market just tanked, right? The market just absolutely, you know, I don't wanna say collapsed, um, but the market was definitely tanking. Um, if you had money in the stock market and you didn't do anything with it, well, you made up for that loss. And, you know, your portfolio was better off a year later than it was now. But that, of course, implies that you, A, have money to invest in the market, and B, are somewhere higher up on the socioeconomic food chain, where when the market tanks, you're not likely to lose your job, your home, you're not likely to default on your loans. Yeah, you're going to take a temporary hit, but you keep your money in the market and it will eventually grow back. Now, that's great if you have money in the market. If you don't, and you're part of the majority population around the world that does suffer the repercussions when the market does take a hit, you're not likely to recover. And you're really not going to be all that interested in knowing right, that the market has rebounded when you've lost your job and you've lost your you know, only you know, source of income. So, you know, the understanding that we can take away from now, you know, 20 years of this type of free market fundamentalism, right, this shock therapy that was sort of imparted on many, you know, post-communist, post-colonial countries to just simply capitalize and go, is that it's going to benefit, it's going to immensely benefit, immensely benefit, you know, the upper 10% of the population, but at the direct expense of the other 90, right? That's the whole thing. And, you know, whereas let's say, you know, economic problems in the past could be met with state intervention, right? State welfare, um, you know, some variation on a new deal, uh, so, you know, or better yet, just simply, um, you know, a worker's response, uh, uh, you know, a socialist Marxist response to, if not overthrow the system, you know, counterbalance uh, the system. Um, it's just simply not there right, is simply just not there. And you know, previously, previously, right, this neo-Keynesian approach where the state would kind of, you know, get itself involved when the free market was either sputtering or spiraling out of control um, was now assumed to be the vocation of the very market that was booming or busting, right? The idea that this, uh, you know, invisible hand theory would somehow make everything better or people would just, you know, save up enough money during times of, you know, economic well-being to cushion themselves um, for, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months. We find out that that just isn't the case. And look, this isn't even in, you know, the, the, the developing countries of sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, we have found that even in the United States, um, the majority of the population um, is effectively living, you know, paycheck uh, to paycheck. And, you know, it, I got to tell you, there's large areas of the United States that resemble, you know, third world environments, um, you know, in that sense. So, you know, obviously we can um, look at the effects of, this era of globalization about 25 years later and note that you know there are some clear winners and losers um, in economic global governance without state regulation to manage buffer cushion direct influence the market itself and when countries are basically told to eliminate as many barriers as many fail-safe protectionist measures to make the country as lucrative as possible to transnational companies looking to set up shop someplace else, well, we end up with, with, with what's called race to the bottom theory, right? Race to the bottom theory in which developing countries will, in so many words, underbid each other for foreign investment um, and manufacturing while simultaneously undercutting 
its own social welfare sectors. So, for instance, um, if um, I don't know, I was, you know, General Motors is looking to, uh, which they have done, um, effectively pull their entire industrial manufacturing sector out of the United States and uh, look to uh, greener, read as cheaper pastures. Um, and they decide, okay, well, we're going to do Mexico, Indonesia, or Malaysia. And I'm just coming up with three countries right now. If Mexico decides, well, if you're going to set up shop in our country, please understand that our workers are unionized. Uh, minimum wage is, um, I don't know, the equivalent of 25 U.S. dollars. Um, and there's a number of expectations, um, insurance um, provisions and other uh, protectionist measures towards the working class that you need to meet, General Motors are going to say, great, thank you, I'm crossing you off the list, and I'm going to go to either Indonesia or Malaysia. So if Mexico doesn't need the jobs, great, you don't have to worry about that. But if Mexico is starved for cash, especially if the country is already taking out loans from the IMF to modernize and get themselves onto the global market, well, they're going to need some way of paying off those loans. And what better way than by welcoming in a strong, secure, guaranteed Western firm? Of course, those Western firms are basically telling the country to allow them to operate literally almost tax-free, pay their workers pennies on the dollar, because if they don't, they're going to go and look for another country to do so, right? And, you know, we might know about this in the United States, we might know that workers around the world are being exploited to give us our, you know, Androids or our, our, our iPhones. But here's the thing. The savings are passed on to us. So if the workers are paid pennies on the dollar, there's no unionization. There's no worker safety provisions. And, you know, we're basically just, you know, manufacturing things in, you know, sweatshops. You know, it's like a century has gone by and, you know, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory has moved out of New York and into, you know, Xinjiang province. Well, you know, hey, the savings are passed on to us, the Western consumer. And, you know, if we were to apply, let's say, world systems theory, good old Emmanuel Wallerstein to the rescue here, I mean, it's not a surprise. Countries with a comparative economic advantage are going to continue to leverage that advantage over the economically dependent, the developing, the global south. Um, here, Marxism has, you know, once again, a major comeback in, in, in understanding international relations theory. So, you know, globalization has produced a number of winners, but at the direct expense of a larger amount of losers. The winners operate directly from the existence of these exploited losing countries. Um, and, you know, instead of, let's say, fair trade that neoliberalism wants you to believe, we end up with free trade. Right? Free trade, which once again disadvantages the economically um, underdeveloped for the more industrialized advanced. Um, and even within those countries, right? I don't want to make it seem like the entire country is just one ginormous sweatshop, right? There has to be a segment of those population that welcomes this investment. And it does happen, right? And th th we see this, you know, definitely uh, within many countries of sub Saharan Africa in which there is a noted area of what we'll just call geographical and demographic target zones of development. Um, these are usually either in one or two places. One is a segment of, let's say, I don't know, the capital city um, that, you know, has housed and, you know, uh, the more advanced, well-to-do segments of society, right? And there's a few of you who have me in this class that took my uh, class on African cities last semester, right? And so you might remember uh, the discrepancies that we noted uh, from, let's say, the official city centers uh, versus that of the surrounding and increasingly expanding informal urban shanty towns, right? In which the poorer, the more corrupt, the shadowy, you know, the shadowy economic sectors of society live. So who are gonna benefit from this uh, transnational global investment, these gated communities, right? These, these, these areas either within capital cities or, and this is what makes Africa such a fascinating country, or I'm sorry, a continent to look at, is that if the capital city is already too bureaucratically cumbersome, outside companies, 
will ins basically f bankroll and fund the creation of brand new cities, right? We're talking like brand new business parks with luxury living, you know, comparatively speaking to, you know, sub-Saharan African standards, right? But, you know, new houses with, um, you know, um, you know, plumbing, electricity, internet, you know, all the amenities, right? All of these gated communities. But these are the areas that are going to directly benefit from outside economic investment. Um, while at the same time, right, areas that are blighted, uh, comparatively speaking, with poverty, neglect, and deregulation are just going to continue to fall further and further off the grid. Um, we don't even need to look at Africa, for that example, we take a look at the United States. We can see that there are a number of urban centers in this country today that, uh, you know, just the rent for, a, you know, a single bedroom apartment is just ridiculous compared to the to what you're getting. But it's New York. It's San Francisco. It's Washington, D.C. It's Atlanta. Um, it's Chicago versus, you know, large areas of what I'll just simply call, you know, the flyover states that have just remained um, neglected and recede further and further into, you know, economic um, irrelevancy. And when we realize that much of this inequity is due to the decision-making of multinational corporations over national governments, in which MNCs can, at this point, due to state deregulation, effectively get states to bribe them over which country will give them better tax deals for setting up their factories, then we know, right, that economic development has little to no connection with human development and well-being. Again, let's look at the United States as another example. And some of you may recall, I believe this was about two years ago, three years ago, I don't remember how long ago it was, um, New York City was on the um, list of final areas for Amazon uh, to set up a new major you know, regional distribution hub. Um, and part of that was you know, really a combination of both Mayor uh, de Blasio and Governor Cuomo kind of working together to, in so many words, almost cede a portion of New York City's sovereignty in Long Island City to Jeff Bezos. Um, and I, it, I don't remember what were the other two places. I'm just going to randomly guess right now. One of them was like Fairfax, Virginia, and the other place was someplace else. I, I forget right now off the top of my head. But these three locations were, through race to the bottom theory, practically figuring out how much more money they could give Bezos to get him to set up shop in these areas. Rather than in the olden days, we would assume Bezos would be the one asking the local governments, well, what are the business practices? Right. And if New York City was like, well, listen, you know, we are just about to um, advance the idea of a $15 minimum wage, unionization, um, mandatory one hour lunch breaks, um, you know, overtime after, let's say, 37 and a half hours per week. Um, everything needs to be OSHA certified. Um, and if Bezos really wanted to set up shop in Long Island City, that's exactly what he would have to abide by. But in an age of globalization where all of these things are you know, basically encourage local governments to deregulate to get business to come in, um, we would effectively cede control over a quarter of Queens to Jeff Bezos. Knowing full well that the infrastructure, the population, um, is just going to suffer immensely because of this. And eventually the blowback kind of got him, got Bezos to look elsewhere, and, uh, you know, it didn't happen. Uh, some people say that this was the worst thing that ever happened to New York because of all the jobs that were lost. Um, and others would say, well, pfft, I mean, you've seen the Walmart effect, right? Walmart will say it creates jobs. Walmart will, you know, create a thousand jobs while at the same time eliminating 500 others, um, killing small businesses, um, undercutting any, you know, smaller mom and pop shop for the sake of, you know, mega Walmart savings. And for what? I mean, what does it ultimately end up doing? A Walmart worker, um, you know, is, you know, makes, you know, horrible salary and the turnover rate for, you know, people leaving the company within six months is, you know, one of the highest out there. So, you know, this, again, this is nothing new. This is not like this is new stuff in the 1990s. I mean, you know, this stuff was happening about a century earlier um, 
you know, in Latin America with, uh, you know, many of these uh, major oil companies, um, you know, fruit companies. I mean, you know, the American fruit company, I forget what the full name of it was, you know, but this is how we get banana republics. You know, we basically will, you know, gut the sovereignty, the decision making of smaller, you know, dependent prone states to become economic vassals of a larger country. Um, all for the sake of having the pleasure of knowing that you get first um, preferred customer status to whether it's the United States or Germany or the United Kingdom, you know, or France or something like that, right? But this is how we get banana republics, not the stores, right? The actual, co uh, the actual countries, right? In which rentier state economics basically undermines any kind of democratic, let alone social democratic, um, provisions, fail-safes, and social safety nets. Um, and so, you know, look, I know that I'm kind of going a little off topic when we talk about, and since the whole lecture is on UN developmental aid, but it's necessary to know what the developmental aid is now finally being talked about in addressing. Right? So it's not enough to just simply say, oh, the UN is now taking human rights issues more seriously. Or, the, you know, the United Nations wants to eliminate, you know, world poverty and hunger. I mean, great, but why now? It is within the larger shadow of these structural adjustment programs, these SAPs, that have really exacerbated the difference. If I want to stay within, um, you know, Wallerstinian world systems theory between core and periphery. Right, between um, economically advantaged versus economically dependent. And when we understand these structural adjustment programs that you know, are kind of presented in a way that says, you know, yeah, the, you know, the next five to 10 years are gonna suck, but you, know, you follow the neoliberal model and everybody will be better down the road. Um, you know, forget what actually happens in those five to 10 years. Forget the growth of impoverishment. Forget the you know existence of parallel corrupt um, shadow authorities and organized criminal syndicates. Um, you know, forget the um, collapse of state infrastructure because the state no longer has a budget that is able to provide for you know the roads, the schools, the hospitals, and whatever because the state is basically indebted more so to these companies and the IMF and the World Bank than, you know, having the money to invest in their own infrastructure, um, you begin to realize, hey, listen, what needs to be done to meet these stringent economic conditions for the next loan or payout, right? So in order to actually meet, you know, the expectations of a Bezos wanting to set up shop in your country, if you don't have the money for that, you promise to give him, you know, tax benefits. So, you know, he's operating effectively scot-free, um, you lower your taxes, you lower your protectionist me measures, you still got bills to pay. So what do you do? Take out a loan. Take out a loan from the World Bank, from the IMF. But in many cases, once someone, once you go to somebody asking for money, the creditor has every right to condition, right, um, reimbursement on a number of criteria, right? And it's kind of the same thing. I was mentioning this last semester, to a number of you um, who had me both for the African Cities class, but also for the International Organization class. Think of it like this. Think of um, you as a student taking out student loans um, and putting yourself in the same position as, let's say, a developing country. Um, this should get the point across. If you are a student at LIU, or it doesn't matter where, right? it could be anywhere, right? And you don't have the money to pay for the increasingly rising cost of tuition but you need to go to school and you know you don't qualify for a full ride or you might get some um, of your tuition money um, you know knocked off because of your grades but you still have to pay the other amount right and it's not an issue of whether your parents didn't save up um, because at, you know in this day and age the, the price of going to college today is twice what it was 10 years ago and two and twice and, and three times the amount that it was 20 years ago, right? So it's like nobody can really save up unless you, you know, anyway, you get the point, right? In order for you to qualify for a loan in order to go to school, you have to be a full-time student. If you're part-time, most of the time these loans don't count. So you have to go full-time. But the thing is, is that you take out money for a student loan, 
You cannot use that money for rent, for food, or for other living expenses. That money goes solely to paying off your tuition. And that's it. So if the tuition keeps going up and your loan remains the same, right? You got to throw all of that to tuition. You're still paying some of it out of pocket, <coughs> which means that your living expenses also need to be taken into account. Now, if you're going to school full time, you still got rent to pay. You still got food to buy. You still have other things to do. Now, you know, maybe your parents, right? You're living in the suburbs and everything is taken care of. Great. Or you could be in a school where your parents are working class. Your first generation going to college. You've got financial obligations. You have to work to support your family, to support your own parents. So in addition to having to go to school full time, you have to go to work. And going to work part time doesn't pay the bills enough. Sometimes you got to go to work full time and you got to go to school full time. You have to go to school full time to qualify for the financial aid. You got to go to work full time to make the extra money to pay every other living expense. And the other problem is that you got to be on top of your grades. If you don't pass your classes, if you don't maintain a certain GPA, you get on academic probation by the university. The university doesn't care about anything that you do outside of the university. They don't care if you work or not. They don't care if you're rich or poor. What they care about is, are you meeting the grades to qualify for financial aid? And if you don't, right, then all of a sudden your financial aid goes into jeopardy. So this is the problem that we find with states, is that by taking out loans in order to modernize and be part of the globalized network, they have to make good on certain expectations that come with those loans. Same thing with student assistance, right? Financial aid for college assumes you are gonna go full time. If you have to cut back on classes because you need to work to pay the rent and other elements, you run the risk of losing your next payout, right? So in this sense, structural adjustment programs, which oftentimes are much more financial and technocratic than social democratic and humanitarian, doesn't care. You need to meet the numbers. You need to figure out what needs to be done in order to A, pay off the loan that you currently have, and B, qualify for the next set of loans. Because if you don't, that, in, that, that interest money is going to kick in and your economy quickly will recede into recession. So what we have found since the 08 economic crisis is that economic solutions alone do not produce the intended democratic needs. Right? The idea of structural adjustment in five years, 10 years, you know, suck it up, deal with it, it's gonna happen, we're all gonna be better off, doesn't work, okay? It does not work. Because externally imposed economic directives are designed without regard to economic well-being of the target audience, right? Externally imposed directives are oftentimes organization to government. We don't care about the people. We certainly don't care about the lower half of the population that are living, for the most part, on subsistence levels. And so it's not a surprise. You know, it is not a surprise, ladies and gentlemen, in the last 30 years that there has been some kind of backlash, some kind of political response to this in Latin America, in the Middle East, even in Central and Eastern Europe, even in the United States that, you know, harkens to some form of populism and nationalism, which doesn't necessarily address the issues, but just simply rails against it. And suddenly we end up looking at the very areas of the world that we thought would benefit from economic development and are receding into these nativistic, quasi-authoritarian governments that without connecting all the dots will come up with these asinine solutions or these explanations like, well, Latin America doesn't really have a long history of democracy. Well, Africa has just been poor and it's just got one problem after another, you know, tribalism, warlordism, uh, rampant poverty, uh, you know, people just, you know, no one knows anything about, you know, the, uh, you know, the history of post-colonial Africa or the rise of uh, populist, uh, illiberal governments 
in Central Europe, the Balkans, and we think to ourselves, well, you know, these people lived under communism. You know, what more do you expect from them? And these, you know, explanations from, you know, talking heads, from, you know, State Department officials, the people that, you know, the so-called experts on CNN, MSNBC, people who give these, you know, high-paid speeches at the World Economic Forum, I'm sorry, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. You know, these are the very people that create the conditions that lead to the erosion of qualitative democracy. Right? I teach about this in my comparative politics class. And all these things are somehow connected. And it's all just one big, you know, anthology. So economic global governance actually creates more problems than provides solutions. All right, so then we take a step back and we're thinking, all right, well, you know, shouldn't the UN step in? Should Red Cross, should uh, the European Union, should, you know, someone step in? You know, isn't this the role of international organization to kind of rein in um, you know, the rampant tech, you know, technocratic policies of the IMF and the World Bank and kind of put limits on what multinational corporations can extort from countries. And the sad reality is that these organizations like the UN, they have a role, they have a very unique role in identifying, coordinating, and directing economic global governance in the promotion of transnational cooperation and regional development. In other words, you know, the UN is very good at, you know, saying what should be done, you know, and giving these lofty speeches and, you know, you know, providing these nice little visuals when you go to the UN on tour. You get to see the 17 developmental sustainability goals and like, oh, isn't that nice, right? But that's about as far as they go. They lack the fundamental powers to execute and implement reform for the betterment of all people. Um, and while I don't want to say that the UN's developmental agenda is useless, um, it's a little late to the party. And because of its uh, no, haphazard, decentralized, uh, completely dysfunctional nature, I'm talking about you, ECOSOC, um, good luck going against these far more organized regimented, disciplined, technocratic, money-lending organizations in the world. And what's even more is that if the UN gets as far as reaching the ear of state leadership in a country in offering the need for reform and humanitarian development and, you know, sustainability and all of those good things, right, this ultimately remains still the vocation of states, and more specifically state governments, to decide how they want to operate. And herein lies the big problem. You as a state leader may realize right, the IMF is bleeding your country dry. Multinational corporations are forcing you to make these draconian cuts to you know, social economic protectionist measures in order to, you know, be a team player on the global market. So you got to make a lot of these Faustian bargains with, you know, economic, um, you know, authorities, many of whom are completely um, unassailable and, um, you know, unaccountable by your country's public. And then, you know, you get the UN and other groups saying, hey, you need to reform, you need to, you know, improve your democracy, you need to do this, you need to do that, right? Um, these state leaders are oftentimes put in a quandary because it's, it's an either-or decision. I can either reform at the risk of losing my loans and having these companies pack up and leave. Um, and what is already detrimental to my citizens and their economic long-term and well-being might be even doubly worse if they pack up and go. You know? So these states are kind of hamstrung in what they can do, which may explain, again, this is just a hypothesis, it may explain why states oftentimes will, you know, balk at environmental regulation, right? I mean, no country is going to openly say, no, man, I don't believe in clean air. No, man, I don't believe in, you know, clean drinking water. I mean, you know, no one, I mean, you got to be a real sociopath in order to say that. But there are a number of countries, right? Um, and I'm just being, you know, sort of broad-based right now, that uh, bristle when they're being told that they're, you know, destroying their environment. Uh, because the answer, the explanation that they give is, 
you know, look, I got to make a whole bunch of, you know, painful decisions because I'm forced to modernize um, what would normally take about a century you want me to do by next Thursday. So if the Yangtze River, if the Yellow River is literally yellow, <laughs> if the, you know, the air quality of Beijing is one of the most polluted in the world, I mean, you know, it's... Well, then set up shop elsewhere. Y'all are wanting to set up your sweatshops in China. So, yeah, it's, you know, so, yes, modern-day China is going to look like, you know, Charles Dickens's London, you know, back in the day. Um, so it's not like we're rejecting um, environmental reform just for the sake of rejecting it. But we're doing it because we have pre-existing economic commitments that we just can't do you know even if, let's let's just say again, again i'm not speaking on behalf of xi jinping but if china decided to all of a sudden um create a whole bunch of economic policies uh, i'm sorry environmental policies right environmental policies that would alongside their industrial output right um you know go a significant way in you know sort of um, reducing pollution and air quality and whatever that's going to be somehow seen as impediments obstacles to economic growth. Um, it's not just the Chinese government, right? Or the, you know, whatever it is. It's the corporations themselves that will lobby against these things because at the end of the day, that's seen as obstacles, taxes, something that prevents them from, you know, achieving, uh, you know, their complete output. So international organization, they're really good at raising the awareness, but, you know, when, when the word goes out, you know, oftentimes things get fragmented uh, within multiple um, email inboxes. So how does the UN then step in? I mean, how, you know, does that mean that the UN just kind of give up? Well, no. I mean, the UN has been trying, um, you know, repeatedly, year after year, to be a bit more, you know, proactive. The only thing is, is that their current structure... Um, shapes the UN's involvement rather reactively and randomly, as I've already mentioned, uh, due to ECOSOC's, you know, decentralized nature, right? which almost you know, just makes it sound like a joke, uh, you know, in comparison. <clears throat> you know, we've got, let's say, more than 30 uh, separate developmental organizations, and that's a conservative number right now in ECOSOC, let's, let's say 30, with their own separate locations around the world. No, they're not all in New York or Geneva or Nairobi or Vienna. They're all over the world. They got their own autonomous administrations, their own budgets, their own objectives, right? It's just basically a series of little fiefdoms. You know, if you're a history nerd, you know, think of, um, you know, pre-United Germany back in the day where there was like, you know, dozens and dozens of these little petty German city-states whose currency and authority and coats of arms and royal families extended very, you know, few beyond city walls to make it just like, you can just pick one off after another. Some of the reasons why, you know, Napoleon was so easy and so good in, you know, conquering Germany at the time. Um, and any attempt at coordinating although not controlling, that would be way too draconian at the UN, but attempts at coordinating, um, you know, these organizations, um, at the absolute best, falls under a newly created group. This is what the UN does, right? How do we try to organize and reduce the amount of fractured and repetitive work in the UN? We'll create another organization tasked with <laughs> coordinating and organizing, hence the UN Development Group. Okay? And the development group, as I said, tries to coordinate, not control, right? There's, you know, people are very, um, you know, protective of their little fiefdoms. So, the, you, you know, the UNDG serves really to exchange information and create a common administrative set of procedures. So rather than um, downsizing one, um, absorbing one into another, and reducing the number of development organizations. The UNDP just kind of serves as a, what better way to look at it, a social media platform for all of them to kind of tell everybody who they are and uh, what they do. And at the end of the day, it really does little more than add another layer of administrative bureaucracy, right? So these groups, if they have to in some way report back to either ECOSOC and or the Secretariat, now they also got to do this to the UN Development Group. So, you know, it, it's clear, right, that there's really no cohesive unity within uh, ECOSOC, within the UN's developmental wing. And this 
more than undermines, right, the UN's effectiveness. Um, as I've already mentioned, many of these groups sometimes operate completely unaware that another one is operating, you know, sort of down the street. And sometimes um, both groups will compete for audience, for funding, sometimes from the same donors. In other situations, you've got like a wealthy Bill and Melinda Gates that truly believe in the cause of one of these things, right? And, you know, their web page and their, um, you know, mission goals might be very lofty and very noble. Who knows how much of an effective reach they have, but guess what? You get money from Bill and Melinda Gates. You get money from Bono. You get money from any of these wealthy individuals who, you know, want to leave a legacy for themselves. And, you know, they're going to function. They may not have any more than 30 people operating for them, but that's a paycheck. That gives them something to do. And if at the end of the day, all they really do is get on the ground and pass out some pamphlets and hold a conference and, you know, maybe even a few, you know, photo opportunities for smiling African school children. Well, that's enough for the web page to say that this thing exists. And to the outsider, it's like, oh, my God, this whatever, whatever it is, looks like they're doing so good. When in reality, they're a little more than 30 people that, you know, get together once a month for a pizza party. And any attempt at trying to combine, streamline, or organize different principles into one more of a unified set, I mean, forget it. Um, it just is met with absolute resistance um, and people, you know, sort of bemoaning, right, the, the immoral uh, attempt at shutting down what is truly, truly a humanitarian organization that works in this area and this area of the loan, alone of the world, right? So if nothing else, folks, um, you know, studying the UN and its developmental agenda wing tells us that the first thing that needs to happen, and again, this is theory, we're talking about it in an academic setting, so easier said than done, that the UN is in critical need of reform and leadership. But I'm not going to get into internal reform, right? I mean, that's just an, you know, an exercise in futility right now, and you know, something that we can put aside for one of the more uh, later lectures in this uh, series. Now, I'm talking really about um, really two things. One, and, the, and, and again, both of these things are things that the United Nations can do right here, right now, given its, uh, you know, its, its structural format. The first is continue promoting this sense of global multilateralism. And the second is uh, repositioning, or at least trying to reposition the, you know, the, um, the conversation, the discussions of globalization, away from technocratic heavy economic policies. And I think that you know, one can do the first um, and accomplish the second. Right? Promoting multilateralism is something that the UN has been involved in probably since the mid-90s. And uh, with the now definitive end of American unipolarism and the very clear advent of a new multipolar world in which the United States, China, uh, Russia, Iran, Brazil, um, and a number of other regional powers are a part of, um, the United Nations is in a very new uh, and rather advantageous spot to kind of serve as a, if you want to think about it, um, a global coordinator, right? A way, uh, you know, an organization that is trying to, let's say, diffuse diplomatic rivalries, right? Especially as the United States tries to reassert um, its global presence after four years of Trump. Um, and is going to, you know, be reminded, if it hasn't been reminded already, that, you know, its, it's paramount position prior and is something that is really a memory. So, you know, if we're not talking about international government, uh, the United Nations can certainly promote multilateralism through its governance, uh, particularly uh, through coordination and leadership in financial markets, public health, climate change, security, education, food and water, environmental protection. I mean, these are things that the United Nations is very good at raising awareness of. And I would even go so far as to add this. If the UN can't really do more than raise awareness and remind everyone of the importance of these things, um, it's got one other major asset in its arsenal, and that is the Secretary General. Um, I think increasingly the UN is going to have to look at future secretary generals as more charismatic, as more extroverted, and more willing to be out there as a public figure 
uh, to use his or her role as the spokesperson of the UN in branding the UN really as an active, involved, engaged, dynamic, caring um, international organization. Um, it's, un you know, it, it's historically speaking, you know, UN secretary generals are, um, you know, officially they're chosen for their, you know, record of excellence on the international field. Uh, unofficially, uh, they're largely also chosen because they're you know, relatively small, harmless, um, you know, able to be overshadowed by, you know, more, uh, you know, political world leaders. I think that after Guterres, the next UN uh, Secretary General, if he or she really wants to promote the multilateral engagement of all of these transnational policies, the UN must, and I mean must, be at the forefront of just marketing itself um, as that global force for change, development, and improvement. And I think another thing that it has to do is, as I mentioned, right, reposition uh, discussions of globalization away from technocratic heavy economic policies. I mean, this is going to involve, to a small degree, the UN taking on a little bit of a political role and kind of recognizing that, you know, its chief rival right now in the world is the International Monetary Fund. You know, whether it's the IMF or the World Bank, I mean, you know, there is an unbroken line of financial global institutions that stem from the Bretton Woods traditional agreements that have been very organized, very adamant in meeting their goals and objectives. And as we just spent the last half hour or so talking about the side effects of these things from a socio-political and social democratic point of view, if there's no other organization out there to bring that stuff up, then it has to be the U.N., and, you know, if the UN's going to take on a little bit of a political role, then yes, it needs to talk about strengthening of regulatory institutions and civil society as well. You, know? you can't just simply operate out of the General Assembly. You cannot operate out of the Secretariat. You can start from there, but if you realize that your goal is to influence and direct and guide, um, you need to have some audience within your geographical region, your target states, you know, what have you, on the, you know, the civil society side that is, you know, ready to rebuild what has been deregulated, to reestablish what has been rolled back, right? Again, not for the sake of walling up the world anymore, but in realizing that there has to be some kind of state involvement in regulating, directing, and monitoring free market capitalism, right? Otherwise, we're going to continue with the socioeconomic inequalities. We will continue to devastate, right, the ecological and, um, you know, environmental landscape. We will continue to see an increase in human rights violations, um, an increase in global poverty, um, you know, detrimental effects uh, to climate, um, a reduction of natural resources, both on land and water. And, you know, at, at a certain point, we're going to reach a tipping point where, you know, all the money and all the economic technocratic solutions in the world are not going to be available or able to do anything in saving this planet. So, you know, at the risk of, you know, using this lecture to kind of go from informing to soapboxing, um, I don't want to make it seem like the UN has to take on the IMF. But the UN at the, absolutely, at the absolute least needs to counterbalance the IMF. Now, the IMF, again, has impoverished way too many countries and destroyed the you know, sovereign decision-making of you know, more than just Greece. So the United Nations, if it plans on really using its developmental goals for something other than you know, posters uh, for you know, tour guides, um, it's going to have to take on a more proactive role. You know, in this category. Um, and I think that that has helped explain the specifics of the um, UN developmental goals. Right? Again, we start from the rhetorical and, you know, we at least have some guidelines, right? We have some kind of, um, you know, goalposts to uh, meet. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, you know, lecture, right, they number, among other things, the, um, the eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, um, achieving universal primary education, uh, promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women, reducing uh, the mortality rates in children, um, improving 
um, the health and well-being of mothers, uh, combating pande uh, pandemics like HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases of which COVID uh, is certainly uh, attached to, um, ensuring, promoting, and protecting uh, the environment and sustainable environmental regulations, uh, and developing a global partnership for making all of these things happen. Uh, the developmental goals, which were, um, you know, I guess listed in 2015, um, I think had way too many lofty aspirations for reaching by 2020. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the great things about being a bureaucracy is that when you fail to meet your own benchmarks, all you have to do is just, you know, extend the deadline <laughs> for another five or 10 years. But, you know, have the, have the sustainable developmental goals been partially met? Well, you know, some, you know, some success um, can be uh, highlighted here. Um, within five years, let's take a look at, let's say, eradicating extreme poverty and hunger. So by 1990 standards, 50% um, of the world's people uh, living in developing countries lived on less than $1.25 a day. And um, within that, 24% of people living in developing countries were undernourished. Um, jump ahead about 25 years or so by 2014, and um, the number of impoverished has been reduced from 50% to 22%. The number of undernourished has been reduced by more than 10%, from 24 to 15. Um, the gains were mostly seen in China and Southeast Asia. Um, some more problematic areas remain uh, in Africa. So, you know, partial success, but still works in progress. What about achieving universal primary education, right? This usually is somewhere between, let's say, K through five. Um, by 2020, 90% of all children are attending some kind of primary school, okay? Um, so that also is a major improvement, right? Now, of course, after the fifth grade, by the time we get to secondary or high schools, uh, the numbers continue to drop off. But if the goals are just simply primary education, um, you know, some you know, significant success has been met. What about the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women? Um, in relation to the previous goal of primary education, um, one thing that the UN is very good at uh, announcing is that there is the near equitable achievement of both uh, girls and boys uh, at uh, the primary education level. Now, the persistence and the disparities between the two uh, remain higher once we get to um, higher education, even in the labor market. But if we're focusing just on uh, primary education, much of these goals, um, while not specifically targeted towards girls, um, definitely see girls benefiting more than boys, right? And this is uh, especially true in uh, many developing countries in Africa, certainly in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. Uh, there was a deluge, right, of, uh, you know, of young uh, females now being able to go to school, at least for the first couple of years. What about the reduction in child mortality? This is very much um, connected to public health, um, access to clean uh, drinking water, um, food, um, various forms of vaccinations, nutrition. Um, <clears throat> child mortality by 2020 has been reduced by 50%. Again, not bad. However, once again, 80% of the remaining 50% of these child deaths continue to remain in Africa. So if we break the world up by region, right, we find that the best areas of improvement lie in Southeast Asia and East Asia, and to a lesser extent, but no less notable, the Middle East. Africa, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa, still remains one of the most problematic uh, areas. Um, and while we're on the subject of um, public health, maternal health, right, and this is reducing the amount of um, child delivery deaths, um, we have noticed also a uh, notable decrease in maternal mortality, although once again, the data kind of is already showing a pattern. Um, <clears throat> much of maternal mortality is still comparatively higher uh, in Africa than elsewhere. What about in combating diseases, pandemics like AIDS, malaria, and others? 
Um, what we find by 2020 is 9.5 million people in developing countries now have access to uh, antiretrovirals. Uh, we have prevented more than 3 million deaths uh, from people afflicted with malaria, and 22 million lives were saved from tuberculosis. So, you know, diseases that have been largely eradicated in the developing world are now finally being combated and, you know, reduced significantly, right, to the point of near extinction in the, you know, the next few years in the developing world as well. Not bad, right? So far, so far, right? The UN has been, now we can't say that this is all the UN's success, but at the absolute least, right, and I just take like a, in a little brief pause before I continue, by making these benchmarks, right, what is basically about, um, what, five or six years ago, the progress has been notably significant, right? I mean, if we were to, you know, take all things into consideration, um, there has been a significant improvement in human development and well-being. Um, things, unfortunately, taper off once we get to the environment. Um, you know, the insurance of environmental sustainability is probably one of the biggest victims of uh, economic modernity and industrialization. And, you know, this isn't just deforestation, but this is also, you know, arable land, clean water, clean air. Um, you know, in the last, um, you know, five years or so, uh, we have seen a uh, catastrophic loss of uh, forested areas. Now, 13 million hectares of forest have been lost. Um, and this is either to logging or to, um, you know, wildfires. I mean, we hear about this every year uh, in Brazil as one of the biggest, biggest problems. Um, and with that, we have noticed uh, a 50% increase in carbon dioxide uh, emissions. Um, now, on the flip side, uh, close to 90% of the population uh, have some access to some, you know, improved, uh, pardon the typo there, uh, improved drinking water, and 2 billion people uh, have improved sanitation, right? So it's a mixed bag, but, you know, the increase in carbon dioxide and the uh, millions of uh, acres of forest lost certainly adds uh, to the larger, you know, concern. And I think this is one of the biggest problems, right? Global warming. We've got, um, you know, if you remember, I don't know how many years we now have left, what, 10 years, maybe even less uh, before we reach a point of no return. Um, and once that happens, the effects uh, could be absolutely catastrophic uh, for the world. So, I mean, if you want my opinion, what is the most pressing uh, transnational issue in the world today? It is global warming and uh, environmental uh, protection. And finally, um, you know, in the goal of developing global partnership for, you know, future development, ongoing development, I mean, it remains a work in progress. So, you know, the, you know, the word, you know, the data is still out on that. So, you know, on a grade scale, I would say the uh, sustainability goals are B, B minus. Um, I don't know, I'm more inclined to maybe push it more towards the B minus, um, maybe upper C plus when we think of the, um, you know, less than stellar results um, on environmental sustainability. But, um, you know, we have to think about something else here before, um, before we move on. And, you know, Improvements to maternal health and uh, the reduction in pandemic diseases means that the global population in the developing world is going to increase, right? The, the number of child deaths that would normally result from disease, um, the lack of, you know, drinking water and others um, kind of, you know, kept the population, I don't want to say um, stable, but the increase in public health, the access to clean drinking water, the vaccinations that now happen means that, you know, we see a population spike in Africa, right? Over the next uh, 50 years, most uh, projections have said that Africa will be the fastest growing continent in the world, right? It's the one area where populations will not only increase, but almost skyrocket uh, in comparison. Global population increase is you know, obviously going to have an impact on environmental sustainability, especially if the global population is still largely dependent on fossil fuels 
and, uh, you know, industrial era energy from, you know, previous decades. So if there is a transition to, let's say, renewable energy, green energy, uh, we might be able to, you know, see some noted improvements um, in environmental sustainability. But right now, um, you know, even in the United States, I mean, debates over the Green New Deal um, are still largely predicated on whether this is, you know, socialism taking away your freedoms or not. And when, when we have this type of, uh, unfortunately, I have to say, asinine way of, uh, you know, basing this argument in, we've got a long ways to go, uh, unfortunately. So, you know, this leaves us, um, as we head towards the end of this discussion, with, uh, once again, a number of inconvenient truths. Um, sad realities that, uh, whether you like them or not, uh, need to be addressed. The first is that international global governance, like the United Nations, can, at best, right, be shaped by international institutions, as much as certain. But those focused on development and well-being often lack the abilities to implement anything. Right? This, this really revolves around the goodwill and the decision-making of states, which if we were to look at the you know, partial, partially successful results of the UN's uh, sustain, sustainability goals, they have been met to a degree. Right? They could be better, but you know, they could be worse. Um, so what we ultimately come away with is that the task for implementing well-being, not just promoting, but implementing well-being, falls to the responsibility of the state, which may or may not be in a position to do anything, right? Especially those in the developing world, if they already are, uh, you know, under pressure to make a number of decisions and cater to transnational, multinational corporations, you know, environmental sustainability is, you know, more of a postmodern, post-industrial thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to make light of it, but, um, you know, if the most pressing issue of a country's um, electoral season is uh, whether we um, keep the current level of, um, you know, green energy and, uh, you know, recyclable um, amounts of garbage, or we up it by, you know, 15, 20 percent, um, you've solved a lot of problems. You know, you, you've solved a lot of problems. And then, you know, you've got, you know, the areas like the United States where, you know, the water in Flint, Michigan is still poison, right? It's still toxic. So, you know, the responsibility of making or breaking these uh, developmental goals falls to the states, which may not be in a position to do anything, um, or even more so, it falls to the hands of private organizations and investors. Um, you know, if you really want to, you know, let's say tackle the problems of deforestation in the Amazon, the Brazilian Amazon, I mean, yeah, it's tempting to get rid of Bolsonaro. And, um, you know, I can make the argument that Brazil is easily going to be better off without this guy. But deforestation and the, you know, near terrorization of the logging industry in Brazil existed well before Bolsonaro. We've just publicized it under him because he's just a right-wing nutball. But if we were to get rid of him, and let's say even in the best of circumstances, replace Bolsonaro with, let's say, Lula, um, if Lula is able to basically change Brazil's economy around and make the logging industry, you know, redundant and useless, well, that might be one thing. But, you know, getting rid of leadership is only half the story. Um, changing the decisions and the leverage of private organizations and investors that influence that leadership, um, many of which are far more profit-driven uh, than concerned about social welfare, and will exist, you know, regardless of how many revolutions happen. Um, th I think this is the real, you know, this is the major issue, right? Even when we talk about um, even in the United States, right? <clears throat> um, the idea that if we were to, um, you know, change our daily habits around, recycle more, uh, reuse plastic bags, uh, shift over from plastic bags to, um, you know, reusable, um, you know, tote bags or whatever it is, you know, would that help the environment? I mean, it's a spit in the ocean. Um, the best way <clears throat> to handle environmental concerns is to go after, you know, the top 100 companies and industries around the world that, pollute with reckless, abandoned, um, and oftentimes limit the work, the scope, and the accomplishments 
of more socio-political humanitarian organizations. Um, you know, right now the World Health Organization is a, is a prime example of this in that um, the ability to um, facilitate COVID vaccines to the non-industrial parts of the world is still hamstrung by regulation, by private interests, by the healthcare companies, all right, that are openly opposed to making their medicine public domain, right? Because they want to keep a license on its manufacturing. And you know, even a more, I would say, lighthearted example of the long-term effects of MNCs over um, state activity um, was something that I remember teaching in my globalization class, oh geez, now more than 15 years ago. There was an article in uh, BBC, I think it was around 2004, in which um, <clears throat> Coca-Cola had uh, decided that they were going to build an entire bottling plant in Mogadishu, Somalia. Right? And people were looking at them like, you're absolutely nuts. I mean, come on, you know, this is, this is Somalia. This is like one of the worst places in all of Africa. And Coca-Cola was like, eh, you know, hear me out. We got the money, we got the leverage. And um, what they ended up doing <clears throat> for at least a brief time was being able to hire locals to do all sorts of things, right? So this group did the bottling, this warlord militia group did the day shift security, this rival warlord did the night shift security. Uh, we're paying them, you know, with, you know, Western salaries, we're giving them some kind of job. And for, you know, until the next civil war broke out, um, Coca-Cola's bottling plant in Mogadishu did more to ensure peace and stability and prosperity than any UN humanitarian aid group, than any political intervention from the US or France or Italy or the UK ever did, which leads us to conclude that, you know, if you really want to make some notable major changes in the world today, right, the UN can come up with these ideas. But maybe another thing the UN needs to do is stop talking to state leaders and start talking to CEOs. You know, start talking as much as I hate to give this guy any more power or credibility. Start talking to Elon Musk. Start talking to Jeff Bezos. Start talking to, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates. You know, back in the day, and far be it from me to champion this type of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial philanthropy. But, you know, back in the day, back, you know, about a century or so ago, you know, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, you know, in order to leave legacies for themselves, they would, you know, provide major endowments to museums and opera houses and schools and public parks here in the United States. And, you know, in an age of global interdependency, right, the new philanthropists, rather than spending all their money on a freaking moon base, right, maybe these individuals should be able to, with the money and the leverage that they have, um, send investments um, and development towards many areas of the world that could use it, especially, let's say, the environment. All right? It's just, you know, just, just a thought here. But these inconvenient truths remind us right, that international organizations can come up with the ideas, but <clears throat> what is missing is sending out those ideas to the right people, the right groups and organizations that can put them to good use. So, you know, in the remaining few minutes that we have here, right, there's a few things for us to think about as we really begin the end um, of this class. Right? We still got a couple of weeks, we've got a couple of sessions to, uh, to do here, but I think that we can start making some tentative conclusions about the roles, the function, and the um, formalities of the United Nations. And, you know, one of which is that the most active IOs in the world today remain economic driven, um, which makes you know, global governance of social welfare and well-being difficult to direct and implement beyond broad directives. So the UN's developmental goals, the UN's um, you know, recent involvement in developmental areas and targets, it's good, but we have still a long ways to go. Uh, before, you know, any kind of tangible success can be met um, in, you know, relation to, you know, decades of, uh, you know, economic-driven organizations and institutions. Um, individual states within this understanding are still in the best positions to implement these agreements and directives, right, these, de these developmental directives. 
But we can't forget, in fact, we need to remember you know, before anything else, that these states may already be hamstrung by transnational economic commitments and restrictions. So we can't just simply say that these states are just unwilling to engage in green energy or um, you know, social democratic development if they are already told to meet certain objectives and conform to certain things to meet the next loan distribution. I mean, Greece is just one of those examples of that. So in this sense, another thing to think about is that economic globalization may actually, well, not may, I mean, it probably most likely does, contribute directly to the problems of well-being and human development in the world. In other words, as I said, as I, as I started out at this, 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 um, this lecture, is that much of the sustainability goals that the UN uh, envisioned are goals that, have need, that need to be met because they have been affected both directly and indirectly um, by elements of economic globalization. And solutions to address the latter, right, well-being and human development, that seek to reform the former, the economic aspect. Now, here's where the fun begins, because this runs into a, could potentially run into a number of obstacles from transnational economic organizations, donor states, MNCs, even private interests and enterprise that still possess greater leverage and control over government decision-making, right? The IMF, look, it, it pitted against the IMF or the United Nations. A state is going to default to the IMF. Why? Because the IMF is like the IRS, you know? There's lots of organizations within the United States that can tell you to do this and do that. When the IRS says something, you don't ignore them, okay? Because trust me, they will not relent. So it's kind of the same thing, right? The IMF is going to force states to make a number of decisions that would otherwise go against their developmental well-being aspect. Um, so if you want to reform development by tackling the economic approaches, you better be prepared for some blowback, right? Because many of these technocrats are going to resist, they will fight, and they will do everything possible to maintain this status quo, which is going to lead to, you know, new security dilemmas if unchecked, a rise in political extremism, which is, again, not, uh, you know, not unexpected, um, an increase in nationalism, and a weakening of state leadership and, leg and legitimacy because these individuals are largely going to be, um, you know, pigeonholed in being stooges of the IMF, of transnational corporations. I mean, this, this is sort of the, the you know, the, the, um, the narrative <clears throat> of many right-wing national populist parties in Central Europe, in the Balkans, in the Middle East, um, and elsewhere. Um, you know, and, and this is something that, you know, we can continue to talk about, uh, not just in class this week, but also, you know, bringing into, let's say, some more comparative political aspects to an otherwise IR-oriented subject uh, in the remaining few weeks that we have in class, right? So, you know, there's a lot of things for us to think about when we examine the UN and its sort of late-to-the-game uh, developmental agenda. Um, intentions are good. Um, you, know, the, you know, the philosophy, the rhetoric is there. But implementing it from rhetoric to actual policy, we still have a long ways to go. And, you know, before we even talk about trying to take on the IMF and other technocratic organizations, we need to recognize that the UN is horribly, horribly decentralized, mismanaged, um, dysfunctional, and uh, oftentimes its biggest enemy is itself. Um, so, you know, again, if you want to get a job in the UN, I will be more than happy to write you that letter of recommendation. But please remember that um, in order for you to make the world a better place, you need to make certain that your UN department is streamlined and working in good cooperation and harmony with at least half a dozen others. Otherwise, something's going to get lost in the email and nothing's ever going to get accomplished. But hey, welcome to bureaucracy. That's just kind of how things unfortunately are. All right, so that brings uh, you know that brings us to a close for uh, this section. And uh, as in every week, I look forward to your comments and input. 
uh, in class on Wednesday. And, um, you know, let's start thinking about uh, preparing for the final exam and, uh, you know, coming to terms with uh, our understanding of the UN that we've looked at uh, over the past couple of months. So we've got just a few more weeks of the semester, but uh, no rest for the weary. We are just, uh, you know, starting our uh, concluding section. So I look forward to your uh, input next week, and I'll see you all online again in a couple of days. All right. Have a good one.